Okay, well, it's 3.30. I was waiting for the Tonight Show music to start, but I guess we have to kick this off. My name is Robin Avkarian. I'm a national correspondent for the Los Angeles Times, and you were at a panel discussion called Consumer Moments. Uh, one of our panelists thought it was called Consumer Monuments, which works also. I have to tell you, initially, I think the panel was called Infrastructure. And I thought, well, there's a way to guarantee that nobody's going to show up at 3.30 on Sunday. So we will be talking about these fabulous books. Uh, I do want to start by introducing the authors. My, Michael Hiltzik is the author of Colossus, Hoover Dam and the Making of the American Century. Twice a week, Mike writes a popular and acerbic column for the business section of the Los Angeles Times. He is the author of a number of books, including Dealers of Lightning, Xerox Park, and The Dawn of the Computer Age. And if you're wondering where Mike stands on the political spectrum, let me just point you to the book he wrote before Colossus, The Plot Against Social Security, How the Bush Plan is Endangering Our Future. You're going to have to update that to the Ryan plan, I think, right? Well, it's the same plans. <laughs> no updating necessary. In 1999, Mike shared a Pulitzer Prize for a series of stories exposing corruption in the entertainment industry, particularly in the music business. His next book, The New Deal, is out in September. Bill Sharpstein is a writer, photographer, and award-winning documentary producer. His stories have appeared in the Los Angeles Times Magazine, Los Angeles Magazine, and the Washington Post. I urge you to take a look at his website to see his gorgeous photos. Normally goes the joke about water, it's a very dry subject, <laughs> but not in Bill Sharpstein's hands. His first book, Dirty Water, One Man's Fight to Clean Up One of the World's Most Polluted Bays, looked at the stunning pollution in our own Santa Monica Bay. He moves a bit further south for his new book to the port of Los Angeles. In the docks, which shockingly has no subtitle, Bill goes beyond the scenes with dock workers, shippers, executives, and critics to illuminate issues of labor, conservation, and national security. Ed Humes, a contributor to Sierra and American Lawyer magazines, is the acclaimed author of so many books, it's really getting hard to keep track. I think this one is your 11th, right? Yes. Is it? Yes? OK. Ed left newspapers after winning the Pulitzer Prize in 1989 for a series of investigative stories about the military for the Orange County Register. He often writes about true crime, but also focuses on young people and education. For School of Dreams, he spent a year teaching at a local high school. For no matter how loud I shout, he immersed himself in the juvenile court system. Now Ed has turned his attention to a surprising topic, I think, the world's largest retail retailer. Force of Nature, the unlikely story of Walmart's green revolution, how it could transform business and save the world, is the result. That you took all the actually, subtitles. That last part isn't actually the subtitle. It's oh. the marketing stuff that they put Oh, on I there. apologize. OK, <laughs> so it's not quite as long as it we thought. It was long enough. <laughs> all right. So I thought we would start by asking um, each of these guys to uh, describe your book and to talk a little bit about why you decided to write it. And if you go on for too long, I'll throw something at you, OK? Do you want to start, Mike? Uh, sure. Well, my book, is, uh, as the subtitle tells you, um, is the history of Hoover Dam uh, going all the way back to uh, uh, the original uh, impetus to build a dam on the Lower Colorado, which dates back to the 19th century, and bringing the story forward to the present day when, as I uh, write in the book, Hoover Dam, which helped build the West, has also put the West in a straitjacket. It's, it's helped fuel growth. Uh, 40 million people have come to the West or, uh, uh, or joined the population of the West since 1930, uh, in part because of the abundant water and electricity that the dam provides. But we're now at the era of limits, that this great population uh, in, in the West and the Southwest really has put a strain on the Colorado River and all of our other 
sources of water that, that the dam itself, in fact, the whole system cannot really support. So this is a story that, de that goes from uh, the 19th century to the 21st century. Um, in terms of why I wrote the book, uh, there were a, a number of reasons. One is that um, I was writing a lot about water for the Los Angeles Times at a, at a point when I needed a new book subject. I had finished my book on Social Security, uh, and I gravitate toward subjects that are complex, uh, deep, uh, historical, that have a lot of political and economic context. Uh, it gives me an opportunity to explain things. Um, at the same time, uh, my, my previous work of history, which was the book about Xerox Park that uh, Robin mentioned, this was recent history. Uh, it was about a group of computer scientists who had come together in the 1970s uh, under uh, Xerox's uh, um, aegis and had invented the personal computer, uh, helped invent the internet, invented Windows-type screens that we all know of uh, today. Uh, when I wrote that book, uh, because it, it had happened so relatively recently, I, it involved my interviewing about 300 people, all of whom were still around as I wrote the book and when it was published, and I could feel sort of looking over my shoulder, which is, uh, for, for any author, sort of a nerve-wracking um, uh, experience. And I had resolved that if I ever went back to writing history, um, I would want to make sure that everybody I was writing about was, was dead, essentially, so that I knew that I would have the last word. Uh, and the, the story of Hoover Dam, particularly the, the, the construction period, is long enough ago that uh, anyone who worked on that dam uh, is uh, w well into his, or his 90s, maybe over 100, and there are a few of them still around, but uh, they're not likely to actually be on top of this, uh, uh, this story. So those were the main reasons. Uh, I was writing about water, and at one point, the executive director of the Metropolitan Water District, which uh, gives us uh, water for you know, uh, 14 or 20 million uh, Southern Californians, had, was telling me about where the MWD gets its water. And, uh, and what he said was, well, we get a lot of it from the Colorado River, and we like to do that because it's free for us. And when I said, why is water from the Colorado free, he said, well, we built Hoover Dam. Now, he was lying a little bit, or at least shading the truth, but that was the beginning of, of the, the, really the genesis of this project. Hoover Dam was built as, as a project for California, uh, and that's at least why, what, what, what made me interested in it uh, right off. And I'll, I'll stop there, and um, Robin, you can... I'm sorry, my cell phone just <laughs> rang. I'm the one person who left her cell phone on, and I apologize for that. I also, before you start, Bill, um, wanted to let you know that with about 15 minutes before the end of the program, we'd like to take questions. And there are two microphones set up on either side of the uh, rows of seats. So we'll sort of line up town hall style if you would like to ask the authors a question. Go ahead. OK. <laughs> well, for me, it all started about 15 years ago when I met a woman longshoreman. Now, um, two things about that. Uh, longshore, actually three now that I think about it. Longshoremen are the sort of nuts and bolts part of, uh, hello, um, of the cargo movement um, system in our United States and anywhere actually in the world. They're the people at the ports who move the cargo from either ship to shore or shore to ship. And um, also, some people may say, woman longshoreman. Well, the thing is, is uh, this is a, 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 a place where women prefer to be called longshoremen, not longshore persons or longshore workers. They're longshoremen. So anyway, this was about 15 years ago. And I sort of shudder to think that um, off and on for the last 15 years, I've been working on this one lousy book that it's, only it's not lousy. <laughs> it's only 250 pages. Um, but anyway, uh, she started telling me about her job and her world. And I ended up writing uh, an article about her for Los Angeles Times Magazine back in 1999. And uh, that was a Sunday. That, the following Monday, I suddenly got phone calls from movie producers and literary agents saying, there's something here in this story. You've got to do something. And uh, nothing really came of it. But it really made me think that there is a world here that people want to know about, that it's a total mystery. 
And so one thing sort of slowly led to another, and then eventually I came up with a book that um, talks about the port itself, obviously. There's um, an economic component to it. It is uh, the largest, the Port of Los Angeles is the largest port in the country, and together with the Port of La Long Beach, uh, it makes up a complex that is uh, responsible for 70% of all Asian imports coming into this country and 40% of all imports altogether that come into this country. So it's uh, a huge place and, in a sense, a choke spot for um, if anything happens there, it ripples all the way across the United States. And so that in itself was sort of a, um, a thing to latch on to. And what I ended up doing was taking each chapter and profiling a different person there. And I felt that way I would get away from the sort of academic aspects. And I, I didn't, I'm not, I wasn't really interested in writing a whole book about the economics of the port, but I was really interested in the people. So, uh, for instance, the, the opening chapter is about a port pilot. And a port pilot is, uh, they're all men. Um, they're captains that have, have a tremendous experience. They're probably some of the best mariners in the world. And they board each ship as it comes into the port and actually steer it to its uh, pier or take it out. Uh, there's um, a chapter about uh, the first woman executive director of the port, Geraldine Natz. Uh, there's another one about a uh, tugboat pilot. Um, obviously, there are several chapters about longshoremen because they're basically the linchpin uh, down there, and nothing happens without them. So I tried to make it as a human story as possible, and I think that's one of the reasons why I'm sort of happy with it. Um, and that's pretty much it. So I think if you read the book, you'll learn two things. First of all, that you have to be really concerned about what happens down at the port because it could actually impact what ends up on the shelves of your local store. And then also, just, there's some people down there that are just absolutely amazing. Your turn. All right. Well, um, Force of Nature grew out of the last book I wrote, uh, Eco Barons, which was about uh, environmental philanthropists and um, activists. Uh, and along the way of working on that, I met uh, kind of this odd couple. Um, one side of it was the uh, uh, Sonoma County lives off the grid uh, tree hugging river guide, um, who was not your typical Walmart shopper. And the other side of the couple was the, you know, the Baron of Bentonville, the CEO of, of, of Walmart, our, our nation's monument to consumption, and kind of the opposite of everything this, this river guide stood for. And uh, out of this unlikely partnership that they forged, uh, a, a very surprising thing started to happen. The idea took hold in this big global company that all this environmental crap, all this green stuff that people are just annoying this company about, wasn't so bad after all. That It wasn't a cost, it wasn't a burden to be more energy efficient or to be cleaner or to be more respectful of the environment. It actually was profitable to do that. What a surprise. All that stuff Al Gore was talking about all this time was true. and. Uh, it, the company became this unusual laboratory for testing out the idea that there's a business case for being sustainable. And not only did they find that this, this river guy was right, that there was a business case, because every time they did something, it made them more money, um, whether it was making packages smaller or detergent smaller or using energy efficient light bulbs, you, more fuel efficient vehicles, everything they did paid for itself. Uh, not only did it take hold in Walmart, but it began spreading to all the many thousands of companies that they do business with, whether big ones like Procter & Gamble or little ones like uh, the underwear company in North Carolina that figured out it could cut its emissions and its electric bill by 60% by cleaning the filters and putting in better lighting. Uh, simple stuff that has been staring us all in the face. And when I say us all, I don't mean just businesses, I mean all of us for a very long time. So, so the story is about this odd couple and then an odd idea uh, that, that profit and planet don't have to be at odds, uh, that it's possible for, of all things, a Walmart to sort of get this green religion and actually do something meaningful about it. 
Okay, I have to say when I read your book, I thought, oh my God, Walmart paid him to write this. There's just no way that this story could be so rosy. Of course, that was that the really? first part of the book. By the end, you were pretty hard on them, so I take that back. But it raises the question for me, how did you get access to this story? How did you get inside Walmart like that? How you, you seemed, I mean, he talks in the beginning of the book about a river rafting trip that these, you know, hardcore anti-environmentalist type CEOs have these big epiphanies on. How did you get the access that you got to write this book? Walmart is so secretive. Yeah, well, I have to say I didn't get any special access. It was a lot of painstaking research. It was, um, you know, I didn't drink the Kool-Aid. They didn't offer me the Kool-Aid. I got no, uh, <laughs> no special treatment. But I did have a lot of help from other people who are, have engaged with Walmart. One of the, one of the things um, most people don't know is that there's been secret meetings for years. The head, the head of the NRDC would go down to Bentonville, and, and Walmart didn't care, but they wanted it. The environmentalists wanted to keep it secret. And they had, and Why they had, did they want to keep it a secret? Oh, because the NRDC is not supposed to do business with, with oh. Walmart. And, and, but what they were doing is figuring out how to, uh, you know, Walmart didn't know what sustainability was. You know, they know now, but at the time, the environmentalists knew, but nobody was listening to them. So they actually had the ears of, and they would meet in these auditoriums, 10 times the size, filled with Walmart employees, listening to what the uh, NRDC and the Environmental Defense Fund and Greenpeace had to say. And they were actually listening and taking notes and then going out and saying, all right, well, how can we, how can we stop catching salmon in Alaska and shipping it to China to be processed and then bringing it back to the Amer America to sell. We have such a perverse economy that it makes sense to do that. Um, mm. So uh, they were looking for ways to stop doing that, to stop being so bad. And, and in order to do that, they were opening the doors. And by opening the doors, uh, you know, people like me you know, can, can find out what's going on. So. Now, Bill, you tell some uh, harrowing stories about um, going out with the uh, tug captains and climbing aboard ships. Oh, the port pilot. The port pilot. Right. Sorry, my terminology is not uh, up to snuff. Talk about um, the access you got. You, you know, I know in the beginning of the book you talk about how you thought you would just call the press office and say, hey, I'm writing a book about uh, the port of Los Angeles. I'd like to come on in. That's not how it happened, right? It was one of the hardest nuts to crack I can possibly imagine. Um, there were two sides of it. First of all, the port itself seemed reluctant to talk to me and uh, give me any access to anybody. And then also the Longshoremen's Union, which as I said, was the real important aspect of this book, refused to talk to me at first. Uh, they had a very interesting, uh, passive aggressive way of handling that though. What I would do is I'd call them up and say, oh, you know, I, I talked to someone at the, um, um, at the upper level at their San Francisco office. And I would say, well, yeah, I'm working on this book and i really like to hear about what your um, thoughts on what's going on right now. And he'd say, oh, that's a great idea. I'd like to do that. Let me check my calendar and I'll get back to you. And he never did. And I would call and call and leave messages and I would never talk to them again. Um, I finally got wise to that. I actually wanted to talk to one person, and I was able to actually talk to him face to face, and I went up to him and I said, you know, I introduced myself, and I said, I really need it, I would like to talk to you about uh, what's going on down here. And he said, well, let me get, let me check my calendar and get back to you. He was standing in front of his office, so I pointed out, well, is your calendar in there? <laughs> and he goes, oh, yeah, okay, why don't we check it now? So I was able to get that interview, and that helped because when you're able to tell another person from the Longshoremen Union, oh yeah, I just talked to Dave Arian, and they're going, Dave Arian, okay, well, maybe you're okay. So it, you sort of worm your way into their hearts, but it's very slowly, and it's by uh, association more than anything else. They don't really care that you're working on a book, and they're always suspicious of the press anyway. They've always had a bad relationship with the press. Now, as far as the port goes, I called up the press office, and one of the first things, I thought I'd go do something really easy, and I wanted to talk to a person who was in charge in the environmental uh, department there. And because uh, the port of, uh, actually both ports are responsible for uh, the greatest amount of air pollution in Southern California, and they were pretty open about 
that and how they were trying to do something about it. So I thought, well, I'll talk to him. And uh, I wasn't able to get to, through to his office, so I went to the press office, and this, I left 10 messages, and I never got an answer back. So finally, I just thought, okay, there's gotta be some other way of doing this. And so I went, uh, the Port of Los Angeles has, um, I think it's bi-monthly public meetings. And so I went down to the meeting, uh, and oh, during a break, I went up to a person, I saw that she was with the press office, and I just harassed her. And I said, you know, I have been trying to get a hold of someone from you guys for the longest time. How come I'm not hearing from you? I mean, I was really direct about it. And she just broke down with all sorts of apologies, and from that point on, I was good as gold. Ah, guilt, the <laughs> oldest technique in the world. That's it. Perfect. Now, Mike, um, I know all your sources were dead, so I'm not going to ask you how you <laughs> coddled them. But um, you and I were talking earlier. I was telling Mike that one of the things I love about his story about the Hoover Dam is how he gets at this history of chicanery and venality and all the people who saw that river and just knew it held gold if they could only figure out how to tap it. So talk a little bit about how these people sort of, how the struggle to get to the point that actually something was done. Well, uh, right. Well, the, uh, the story, as I said, does, does go back uh, to the 1800s. And uh, some of the sources I found, uh, p possibly uh, uh, the best source about the early stage of chicanery was a, uh, an autobiography written by one of the fraudsters, actually, mm -hmm. who um, was a man named Charles Rockwood, who was one of the first uh, people to really understand that uh, there was this vast desert in Southern California, which was known as the Colorado Desert, sometimes as the Salton Sink. Uh, nothing grew there, but he understood that the reason nothing grew there was not because the soil was bad, because in fact the soil was rich, it was silt from, from the river uh, deposited there over eons, but what it needed was water, and that if you could bring water from the Colorado River and irrigate this land, you would have a Garden of Eden, and in fact, what we have today is the Imperial Valley. Uh, Rockwood was one of the partners of a man who renamed the Salton Sink the Imperial Valley, and this was a marketing scheme to get people to come and grow, uh, to, to buy the land and, and grow things there, but Rockwood, uh, believed that he had been cheated by all of his partners, and he wrote his his memoir, uh, which I found in, in fact at the UCI library, mm -hmm. although it, there are copies all over uh, all over the place, in which he laid out all of the ways that he had been cheated. And if you if you read novels, you know um, uh, you know the technique of an unreliable narrator, and an unreliable narrator is somebody who's telling the story to the reader and doesn't really understand all the implications of what he's saying. Well, if you read *Born of the Desert*, which is Charles Rockwood's uh, memoir, you discover that while he's complaining about everybody who cheated him, he's actually writing about how he cheated everybody else. And really lays out the entire story of uh, of how fraud and and confidence games were uh, were the key to developing the Imperial Valley in its in its early years. And then it's uh, uh, it's really part of history that what happened then was that Rockwood and his partners were so incompetent at building the canal that brought the water from the Colorado to the desert that in 1905, that canal actually overflowed. The Imperial Valley was almost destroyed mm -hmm. by a flood, and it became clear to the people who actually were now growing $2 billion a year worth of crops there that they needed help, that they could not put their, uh, their livelihoods in the hands of, uh, of private entrepreneurs who didn't know what they were doing and didn't care enough to, to do it right that it, took, it would take the federal government, it was the only entity that was big enough and had enough money and was reliable enough to build a dam to protect them from floods, to produce irrigation water that was reliable, and also, by the way, electricity. So that was really the genesis. Mm -hmm. uh, the genesis of Hoover Dam really was in this spectacular scheme uh, built on a fraud. <laughs> Perfect. Ed, um, <clears throat> who would you say the most interesting character in your book is? And, uh, or what was the most interesting moment? Well, 
Actually, I think uh, my, my gut is to say, well, it's my, my river guide, Jim Ellison, that character, because he's the catalyst for, for what happens. But re really, I think the, I have to think of the, you know, the, the, the big giant Walmart as almost a character in mm -hmm. itself. And that's, the, that's really turned out to be the, the heart of the action. And um, there was a couple really inter interesting moments. One was the... the they're very skeptical about this environmental initiative at first, and nobody really wanted to get saddled with having to deal with it in the company. They, you know, they live in fear at this company that the competition's going to beat them, that something's going to go up a half a penny, or you know, that, that the loads that are coming through the port aren't going to make 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 it in time or under cost. And, and now this other layer of concern about the environment was layered on top of it. But they, they were going to try something. So they sell these toy trucks that they make in China. This is the first thing they did that really had a, that, that began leading them to think differently. And the truck's about this big. The package is about this big, you know, and it's all marketing and slogans and push this little button and all the stuff that they like to put in, in packaging to make people pick it up and buy it. Um, and the idea was maybe we can shrink that packaging down a little bit, make it closer to the actual size of the product, and see what happens. So the first thing that happens is they sell millions of these, so 4,000 trees don't get cut down. So yay, we did something good for the planet. Um, but then they figure out that it took 439 fewer giant cargo containers to ship the same number of toys from China to the US. And now they're saying, well, well that's kind of big. And then. <coughs> many fewer truckloads to haul these things around the country from distribution centers to store. They save a million gallons of diesel fuel in the process. And when all is said and done, the lowered cost for the packaging, the lower cost of transportation, the lower cost of fuel, the reduced carbon emissions, they save two million dollars from one product, from shaving a couple inches off the packaging. They'd have to sell 60 million dollars worth of those toys to make that two million dollars in profits. So, the, you know, Lee Scott joked about it later, and Lee Scott, the former CEO of Walmart, and he said, the light bulb went on over my head, and it was a compact fluorescent bulb. <laughs> and that was, a, was an, a pivotal moment that flipped the thinking about, you know, env environmentalism has always been about Jimmy Carter's cardigan. You know, we can't have a toasty house, we have to wear a sweater. It was always about sacrifice and cost and giving up something. And all of a sudden they realized it's just the opposite. If we do this, the environmentalists are going to love us. We're actually doing something positive and we're making more money. The money is the impetus though, right? Well, it's a business. Of course it is. <laughs> They're not going to Just want to get it on the record. They, they go and to their shareholders and they say, why are you doing this environmental stuff? And they say, because yeah, you're money. getting more money from us because you of You had a story things. about Hillary Clinton and deodorant too, right? Listen yes, to this was... Two what, words. Do you want to hear more about that, yeah, right? Yeah, really, yeah. Well, the reason why, who can remember buying deodorant and you get a container of deodorant, it might be in a metal can, it might be in a plastic roll-on thing, and that would be inside a box. You remember that? The box was flimsier than the actual deodorant. Why did you need to put it in a box? Well, the, the, Hillary was appointed as the first woman to the board of uh, Walmart back when um, uh, the boy governor, Bill Clinton, was in office as governor of Arkansas. <laughs> And uh, a little aside, my, former new my first newspaper boss gave him the nickname Slick Willie. So I have a history that goes way back with the Clinton family. And he, um, uh, Hillary's idea was to begin an environmental initiative. And she was looking at packaging. She said, why are you putting these deodorant in boxes? It's silly. So they, Walmart calls up the deodorant and says, stop putting it in boxes. And lo and behold, they, you know, if Walmart asks for it, they do it. And it takes up less room on shelves. It's cheaper to ship. Product's cheaper. But it was viewed not as an environmental victory, but as a cost savings. And you know, after um, Hillary left, this was in the 90s, or maybe, yeah, there was a loss of enthusiasm for this idea, and it wasn't pursued. But it was a very early validation. Mm -hmm. I mean, they could have, if they had been able to see it, if they had a river guide that said, see, see, look at that, which is really what his job was, to whisper in Lee Scott's ear and say, see. Um, they called him what? They Whis called him the CEO whisperer, <laughs> like the horse whisperer. And, and he kind of describes his job as, um, as walking uh, 
uh, Scott up to, to the cliff and saying it was okay to jump. You know, <laughs> you'll be okay, it's okay. Uh, but that was their first brush with this possibility, but they couldn't see that it could be so much bigger. And, but then in the second iteration, the next, one of the next things they did was laundry detergent. Walmart's the reason why we're not lugging around those giant bottles anymore. You know what those gi giant bottles, bigger is better. The only thing it gave you was more water and more plastic. It gave you no more clean. You know, so they said, we don't want that anymore. The entire industry followed, and now we have smaller bottles. Concentrated. Bill, um, the port is like a really big secret place. Um, you know, you can walk into any Walmart, you can drive across the Hoover Dam or take a helicopter over it, but you really, you can't really get into the port, right? No. So do, what are the environmental concerns that people should have about the port and what, what should we know about it that, um, that, what should we be worried about, I guess is my question. Be very worried. Um, uh, it can be summed up actually in um, three words. Uh, the port down there is known as the diesel death zone. And that was actually a term that was coined by uh, an emergency doctor um, when a reporter asked him. Um, uh, he was an activist and fighting the, the amount of air pollution down there. And he, he was asked, well, you know, what would you, you know, he was asked something about it, and he said, well, I would call this the diesel death zone. And the name stuck, obviously. It's a perfect name for a place. The environmental problems are sort of twofold, and, but it all centers around what are known as diesel particulates. Um, there's two main sources of it. First are the ships. The ships come into the port and they have to, the diesel engines have to sit there and run all the time the uh, ship is in the port, usually about two days to unload and load. And that's to run the electrical systems on the ship. Um, well, unfortunately, the ships run the most dirtiest, lousiest, worst diesel fuel possible called bunker fuel. Um, it is the, the stuff that's left over after everything else has been refined out of the oil. It's just horrible stuff, and it's very, very dirty. And these ships were spewing out the uh, exhaust from these diesel ships running this uh, fuel um, while it was sitting in port. So um, even though because of the way the winds blow there, uh, this wasn't necessarily blowing into the communities, the longshoremen were sucking this up big time. And it is, it's very difficult to find a longshoreman who doesn't know another one who claims that uh, he has a friend who died of brain cancer, for instance, or some respiratory disease just because of working down there for 30, 40 years. So the other source is actually more, uh, is something that we really need to worry about a lot more, and that is the diesel trucks. Uh, trucks go in and out of the port uh, just thousands a day, and they're responsible for moving the containers in and out of the port. Um, not all the containers. A lot of the containers are also uh, put on trains, which also run on diesel. And um, but the 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 trucks are the most insidious source because they're going right through people's neighborhoods. Yeah. And studies have been done showing that uh, children in particular are really susceptible to respiratory diseases as a, re as a result of the fine particulate matter that is uh, blasting out of these trucks every day. And uh, that has been a really big concern. So the port has been pressured uh, over the years and has finally come up with uh, a program to decrease dramatically the amount of uh, fine diesel particulates. Uh, by the way, just to let you know, um, I talked to an environmental scientist who said that these fine particulates can actually travel um, in the morning when the air is still literally about a half mile to either side of the road. So it's not just if you're standing on the curb of the road, you're going to get blasted by these particulates. You could be f feeling really safe where you are, and the diesel's wafting over in your direction. So the port came up with a, a multifaceted program. One of it was to institute what's known as cold ironing. And this is something that's going to take a while to um, get done. But cold ironing is basically plugging the ship into shore onshore electricity. Mm -hmm. And it's really kind of fascinating to watch at least once. It's uh, The plugs are 
<laughs> about the size of a bleach bottle, and there's several of them, and they're just plugged into the ship, and then they can turn off the diesel engines and run on electricity. And uh, now some people might say, well, okay, then um, the electric plants uh, have to generate more electricity, but they figure that in the long run, if this is a more controllable source of uh, air pollution than the ships. The other solution was that the port has now banned all uh, diesel trucks that were made before 2007 from entering the port. And that's caused a lot of uh, kerfuffles in itself, but at the same time, it is also decreasing the amount of uh, diesel pollution. 2007 is the magic number just simply because that's when the EPA said um, all engines at, built after 2007 had to meet certain um, standards of uh, emissions. So anyway, that's what's going on there. It's, it's still ongoing, it's gonna go on for years. I feel a bout of asthma coming on after that. Um, Mike, you talk in the book about how the Hoover Dam um, harnessing the Colorado River was important to the development of the Western states. But you also say, uh, there are some drawbacks and a heavy price paid. Is the Hoover Dam a good thing or a bad thing, and why? Well, uh, that's a very good question, and it's a question that unfortunately I don't think we can answer today because it just is. Uh, we live in the world that was created by Hoover Dam. Uh, we get 40% uh, of our water in this community from the Colorado River. We get electricity. We have Las Vegas as a result of Hoover Dam. Uh, in fact, Los Angeles, San Diego, uh, uh, Denver, Salt Lake, Phoenix, none of these metropolises would be anything like they are today if not for Hoover Dam. So I don't think we can go back and say, well, is it good or bad? Because it's, at this point, uh, part of the landscape. Um, now, that being said, I think we, w w there are a lot of lessons that we have learned from Hoover Dam and lessons that we are still continuing to learn and that we need to learn over and over again. Uh, if, if you look around the country, you discover that uh, the United States has pretty much gotten out of the habit of building dams. Uh, I think what we've discovered over, uh, over 100 years is that as uh, producers of water supply, dams are expensive, they're not reliable, they can be dangerous, they have enormous uh, environmental impacts, particularly downstream, that were not even part of, uh, that w weren't under consideration at all when Hoover Dam was built. Uh, you didn't have an EPA, you didn't have uh, water quality, or you didn't have environmental impact statements that had to be done. Uh, there are uh, habitats and species that undoubtedly have been eradicated from the face of the earth by the construction of Hoover Dam that we will never know about. Um, in this country, we're beginning to take dams down when they've reached their, uh, the end of their useful life, and we've found that there are other ways to produce equivalent water supplies at much lower cost. And, and, but these are battles that we're, we're constantly having to, 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 to go through again and again. You can see farmers uh, marching in the Central Valley of California because they want a new dam to, uh, to augment the, the storage that they get from Friant Dam. Um, but this is expensive water. It's much cheaper, much more effective to do things like um, more efficient irrigation from farmers, more conservation from urban dwellers, more conservation from, from industries, better ways to store water underground and, and in the environment than, than we do get from a dam. So, um, so, so one of the real lessons from the construction of Hoover Dam is what the limitations are of projects like this. Now, at the time it was built, it was the 1930s, uh, the dam was originally scheduled to start construction around 1935. Herbert Hoover knew that he had to do something about rising unemployment in 1930 while he was still president, so he ordered this dam to start, construction to start right away. And over the next five or six years, 10,000 men were put to work on this project. That's 10,000 families or more that were saved from the ravages of depression, so it had a great effect. Uh, as I said, it's, um, it's, it's been the fuel for the development of industry and agriculture, the development of cities across the West, so it's been a, it, it's been a great thing. It's had a massive effect, not only on the West and the Southwest, but across the country. 
Um, but if we were to do it today, would we build this dam? It's hard to say. I think we would be much more aware of what the costs are uh, and, and much better able to measure those, those costs against the benefits than we were then. But we did it then. I think we all should be glad that we did um, because we live in the world that it created. Okay, great. Um, I want to talk to you three about the public images of the uh, entities you've written about. Um, I want, want to hear from you how you think the press has treated your subject, uh, both historically and now. And we know, of course, that this is a struggle, Ed, that defines a lot of um, Walmart's recent press and is central in your book. So I wonder if you could start by talking about the public image of Walmart, um, how it's been treated in the press, how this has changed. Well, if it has. Sure. I mean, Walmart has uh, received a, a lot of criticism, and justifiably, for, you know, for all sorts of its policies and practices. Uh, and I, I review that uh, in force of nature, but it's not central to the tale. I, my focus was the, uh, this idea of, are they really doing something meaningful? Um, environmentally on, on sustainability or was it PR or is it just a flash in the pan because um, I, I was I, <laughs> very skeptical initially um, I, when I first met Jib Ellison the, the, the river guide I didn't know this was going to lead to a book project but um, their impetus initially was uh, out of concern for their deteriorating image. And they were actually losing business uh, because people thought they were evil. It was the evil empire. And they uh, were concerned that the next front uh, against them would be environmental. So how can they play defense? How can they uh, reduce their exposure, which is the term that they like to use, you know, like they're... Um, you know, being exposed to enemy forces, which is how they viewed the, the environmentalists. And, um, Do they so view the press that way too? Oh yeah. yeah. So the um, impetus for meeting with Jib Ellison, the sustainability consultant, was how can we insulate ourselves on this front and and not you know have the same nightmare we're having with the sweatshop scandals and the and the labor issues and the gender issues. Um, and that was when the conversation began. Well, you're looking at this the wrong way. This is the river guy talking. This, this, this is the greatest business opportunity of the century, and you're treating, treating sustainability like it's a burden that you just grudgingly assume. Flip your thinking. Uh, and that conversation uh, began to shift uh, the company's views on it so that... You know, I mean, is there polling, for example, to show that uh, public attitudes have shifted? toward Walmart recently because of what they've oh, done? Oh, yes, or? but the shift began with the Hurricane Katrina, which oh, really was yes. a big act of yes. charity and, and, and a meaningful one, and the press ate that up. And they're, they're yeah. in, that was when their uh, image really improved considerably. Right. Uh, but they've gotten great press uh, on some of their sustainability initiatives and kind of unquestioning, which is, you know, is sort of just take their word for it. And I... I you know, I thought, thought it was important to actually try and validate is there data to support what they're yeah. what they're saying. And in most of the cases, there seems seems to be pretty hard information to suggest that they, they're doing this. I mean, it also uh, the, the anecdotal evidence is pretty incredible. I mean, this is a red state America company, and they gave Al Gore a standing ovation. I mean, the entire company assembled on video and in this massive auditorium, you know, and, and you know, Sam Walton's boys just were in tears watching a special screening of An Inconvenient Truth right after it came out. It was, it, it, it's Twilight Zone-ish, okay? <laughs> Thank you, you they took the words right like out of my Al mouth. They sound like Al Gore when they talk about this stuff. So. Bill, what about the port? Does it have a public image? Does it worry about its public image? Does it manage it? Well, my first flippant answer is it has no public image. Um, the port is like the electric company. Uh, you flip on a switch, you don't think about where it came from. Um, you go to Walmart, and you don't think about how that product got to the shelf. So the port, in a way, is, is part of our economic DNA, but we don't even think about it. Um, but at the same time, the port is incredibly concerned about its public image. Um, 
Uh, even though I didn't ask them to, I want to make that quite clear, they have done a lot to promote my book. Um, even though there's parts of it that are highly critical of the port and the way it's done things in the past, they see it in the large, larger issue that more people need to know about the port and the problems that are going on there um, and how intricately uh, tied to our economy it is. And I think that's the major thing. They're not, I don't, you know, and it's funny, I'm not sure whether the general sh uh, Joe out there, they're all that concerned about. They seem to be more concerned about um, political leaders and getting their mm. ear. And they figure that if, ever, if more people know about how important the port is to the, the rest of the country, then um, when it comes to things like, uh, say, getting congr congressional grants or uh, uh, government grants for, uh, say, more security measures or something like that, um, roads being built or repaired, things, uh, they'll have a more sympathetic ear. Um, one of the things that the Port of Long Beach found out in a study not too many years ago was that, and this is incredible to me still, that every single congressional district in the United States, all 50 states, has some sort of business connection with the Port of Los Angeles or the Port of Long Beach. It is that tied to our country. And so when they find something like that, um, they want to make sure that every congressman, every senator, and every state knows. And gets a tidy contribution, too? That's, well, you know, and it's funny, because I asked uh, Geraldine Nats, the executive director, about that, and she was very open about it. She said, yeah. The reason um, they want to make sure that the local congressman knows about uh, this business connection is that um, these are people um, who might contribute to their campaigns. You betcha. So, yeah. um, now, I want to suggest if anybody would like to ask a question, we'd be happy to take questions. I have plenty of questions that I could keep asking. Are you able to reach a microphone, or do you want to just yell? Uh, Mr. Helzig, I have read in the past about the silt buildup behind the dam being a problem. Is it a problem or not? Okay, so the question is, is silt buildup behind the Hoover Dam a problem? Uh, it, it's not a problem, um, in part because uh, uh, dams have been built upstream for which the silt has become a bigger problem. So uh, the, the Colorado, when the, when the dam was first built, and in, in nature, is a prodigious carrier yeah. of silt. In fact, it's silt, silt a mile down is what the Imperial Valley is, and it's silt from the river uh, deposited over the millennia. And there was a, it was understood when the dam was first built that uh, silt deposits in the reservoir might uh, uh, make the dam unusable within about uh, 150 or 200 years. But because that silt is now being captured upstream, um, the dam has, has many, many more centuries of useful life. Thanks. Yes, go ahead. Uh, this is a question for Bill. Um, I remember uh, when the Greenport, LA, and Long Beach together when in their uh, the conversations were first going public at least, that one of the things was that a, a challenge was that so many of the truckers were independent and, um, and on the edge of, uh, you know, with no economic margin, right? And one of the, th the suggestions was that the Teamsters might actually align with the environmental plan because if you organize the workers and so on, Talk a little bit about that. How they how, be? Are, how have they dealt with all those independents? Has labor been involved, etc.? Uh, Robin will cut me off if I talk about this too long, but it is a huge subject, very complex, um, and he's right. Uh, 90, 95 percent of the truck drivers down um, there are what are known as independents. They own their truck or they're leasing it from a trucking company and then they get their job assignments from that trucking company. So there's a big uh, controversy just over that as to whether or not they're really independent or not. But the thing is, is they have to pay for the maintenance of their own trucks. So as he said, uh, they, it's been figured that um, after all is said and done, they may make nine, ten dollars an hour. And one of the reasons for that is, um, there are extremely long lines behind many of the terminal gates there in the port. And so a truck driver will have a, a, what's known as a can, a container, to say deliver. 
And he could literally stand there in line for two hours just waiting to get into the port to deliver that one can. And the thing is, is he's only being paid by the load. He's not being paid by the hour. So uh, when the port decided to restrict the number, the, 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 the trucks to um, only those made after 2007, a lot of these truck drivers, probably most of them were driving trucks made before 2007. They were just awfully dirty trucks. And they didn't have the money to buy new trucks. And so there were a lot of programs that people put out to, uh, the port put out to try to uh, help them pay for that. And none of them really worked all that well. So there became a point where the port said, all right, here's an idea. We won't allow anybody to enter our port unless they're actually working for a trucking company, not an independent trucker. And the American Trucking Association put them, took them to court right away. And the thing is, is they lost. AATA lost, and the port is now allowed. I think it's still going to be appealed, but um, for the moment, uh, only those truckers um, that are actually working for a company. So when you talk I'm about, about to Teamsters. Cut you off. Huh? I'm about to cut okay, you off. Okay, so anyway, uh, the, te the Teamsters may get involved now because people are actually working for companies and they may organize. Um, so it's, as I say, it's a huge complex subject and probably I could go on forever and I know you're not going to let me. Your next book. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. Um, political scientists talk about the free rider problem when organizations make decisions because there isn't a cost associated with it. The EPA, for example, arose in part because companies polluted rivers because there was no cost to them. You each talk about the converse of that, where organizations have realized that they can have decisions and instead of having a cost associated, that there's a hidden savings associated with it. Do you have any lessons that other organizations can take from what you've each written about in terms of how to approach the problems? Well, I, I guess I can start. Uh, th this is sort of the issue of when does the government, when, when do you need the government to do something that private enterprise can't do? And I think that's what we see in, in the debate today over uh, the government's role in the economy and certainly what we saw in Hoover Dam. Uh, th this was the sort of project that private enterprise uh, could not do uh, uh, competently. But beyond that, when, when Hoover Dam was being um, proposed and, and even built, the, the uh, local electric utilities in Southern California, they all had the idea of building their own dams on the Colorado River. Uh, now, they never did because the government stepped in, but, but w what you would see there is that uh, a power utility would build a, would build a particular kind of dam, and it would serve its business and its market. But you wouldn't then get the, the, the other benefits that you get from having a public generation of power and a, a sense of the, of the public need for irrigation, for flood control, and all those things. And that's what we see when we see great public works, is that they address uh, a multitude of needs uh, that, uh, that go beyond the need of a, of a particular uh, industry or a particular company. Uh, there's, there's no other way to do things like that uh, except through, uh, through what the government is, which is a, a, an instrument of collective interest. So that at least in, in terms of the project that I wrote about, that's why the federal government took on that job. But it was private contractors, consortiums. Well, that built it, right? uh, yes. I mean, you know, because the government didn't have uh, the construction know-how, they put it out to bid, but they supervised it. Now, some would say they didn't supervise it enough because the contractors had more authority over the workforce than was healthy for the workers. Uh, but yeah, the, the government at that point had made a decision that applied to all of its dam projects that it was no longer going to build them uh, itself, but it was going to put it out to bid. And they helped bring together the consortium of six companies, including Bechtel and Kaiser, uh, that built the dam. But it was a government contract. I would say that 
company, these companies and government entities, uh, by the way, the port is owned by the city of Los Angeles, should act sooner than later. Um, you know, in the, the case of the pollution down at the port, the port administration delayed and delayed for many years before they actually started taking action. Why? I'm not quite sure. I was never able to find out. Um, and what that only caused for them was a public image of uh, uh, an institution that just was not interested in public health. And if they had um, acted on this a lot sooner, I think they'd have a lot better um, image amongst the, the, particularly the people that live around the port. Ed, you have a burning desire to answer the question, or will, shall we take another question? Well, I think the, the key concept that uh, it, it's not so much about whether something is a cost or, or, a, or, or, or its opposite, it's, it's what the, what's the risk? And uh, comp big companies are averse to risk, but, um, I think in t when it comes to the environment, the, the idea that a failure to act is the greater risk is beginning to um, penetrate the, the world of big business much more so than it is our you know, Congress, for, <laughs> for instance, which is unable to act. So uh, I, think, I think the risk management equation is now shifting people's views of, of business and environment, and that's actually a good thing, a very good thing. Okay, over here. Yeah, this question's for Bill. Um, as everyone remembers, when they increased all this airport security, there was all this thing in the papers all the time and in the news about that people don't want to be groped or x-rayed or all this other stuff. And as you said, the, the port is kind of out of people's consciousness. What goes on at the port? What's going on new to prevent illegal materials from coming into the country or potentially ecologically damaging or Weapons of mass destruction. How, how do we? we how, how does the port do that better than they may have done five years ago? Well, what's really interesting is I went on a, a drive with a port policeman, and he told me of days where prostitutes would uh, actually just walk through the gates and um, come up to the longshoremen, you know, after payday. So, and that wasn't too long ago, actually. So, uh, security is definitely tightened. Um, I can tell you that I was not allowed inside the port without some sort of escort. Um, one of the things that they discovered was that the effort it's, it's, it's really sort of strange in a way when you think about it that the, the least effort was actually making the biggest bang for the buck. Um, one of the things that the Coast Guard does, which is in, uh, in charge basically of security at the port, um, just goes on random cruises around both ports in a, um, a little patrol boat. And it's that randomness that they feel really makes a big difference uh, because uh, someone who's up to no good will never know when suddenly a Coast Guard boat will come by. Um, but are you also talking about stuff coming in in containers, not just this? It's coming in in containers. How are they so screening how is that? Uh, about less than 1% of all containers are actually inspected. Um, what they'll do is uh, containers will come off and U.S. Customs and, and Border Protection will just randomly go, you, 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 and they'll go through um, a, a sort of a huge x-ray machine. Um, and so they will do that, but very few of the containers are actually inspected in any way, shape, or form. Um, but here's the thing. The Coast Guard has told me that they figure that is the the last way that anything's going to come through. Um, it's because it's too much trouble to put something on a container. The thing that they're really concerned about is just someone coming in on a pleasure boat because there are marinas inside the port, so anybody in a little boat could be coming through and, um, and they could just basically just come up to a pier and blow up. And uh, so that's their biggest concern. It's, it's not the containers. It's these little moments of terrorism rather than a huge one. Well, on that note, um, I would like to thank you all for coming today. Thank you, Michael Hiltzik, Bill Sharpstein, Ed Humes. If you would like to uh, meet up with these authors after the panel, they will be signing books in Area 2. And I thank you for turning out. And thank all of you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.